And let me begin by saying that you will notice the presence of a number of cameras in the room. This is being recorded by a project called Voices from Oxford. And nearly a decade ago, the Voices from Oxford project, that's one word, Voices from Oxford, you can find it easily on the internet, um, recorded an absolutely seminal debate between two great dinosaurs of evolutionary biology and the blue corner Richard Dawkins and in the red corner Lynn Margulis the great champion of symbiogenesis that debate on, went on for four hours <laughs> without a resolution <laughs> and as I said it's all recorded uh, by Voices from Oxford and we're very grateful to the Voices from Oxford team for recording today's lecture too. I'm going to tell you that physiology guides evolution. You see, physiological scientists were almost excluded from evolutionary biology by a very simple idea, which is the blind watchmaker. That the processes that generate change in organisms which can be inherited are totally blind to function. And of course, physiological and medical analysis inevitably has to deal with function. So how did we get into this situation? And the way I'm going to explain that is to compare the 20th century reductive approach in biological and medical science, blind chance for variation, followed by natural selection, evolution therefore has no foresight, with what inevitably I call a 21st century uh, approach, and I call it an integrative approach because I think it is much more integrative than re reductive. And the take-home message I'm going to give you is very simply this, that there is of course blind chance, the variations at a molecular level are indeed unguided, but organisms harness that stochasticity, that randomness, to produce function, as we'll see. And the talk is divided into two parts. First of all, harnessing stochasticity, then how that is used in enabling organisms to respond to stress in the environment in which they live, or produced by other organisms, to lead to genome reorganization. And then I'll finish with the question, was the watchmaker at least one-eyed rather than blind? So the question with which we'll begin is how did the integrative approach to life become sidelined during the 20th century? Let me make clear that I greatly admire the reductionist approach. I've been a reductionist myself in very much of the work that I do on iron channels in cells in the heart. But it's an oversimplified view of living organisms. And we all use this mantra, don't we? From molecules to man. And you notice the directionality in that, a one-way process. And the problem is, this can't be true. Because molecules are not alive. If I took the DNA out of a cell, and I put it in a Petri dish with as many nutrients as you like, I could keep it for 10,000 years, it would do absolutely nothing. Same applies to heart rhythm. If I take all the molecular mechanisms that generate the transport of ions across the cell membrane, together with, again, as many nutrients as you like, there would be no cardiac rhythm. The rhythm is generated as a consequence of an interaction. So it's cells, tissues, organs and systems that are alive through the processes that they generate. So how do we ever get into the situation in which people thought otherwise? Well, it goes all the way back to the great French philosopher René Descartes in about 1664. In a treatise on the fetus, he wrote, if I knew enough of what was in the semen, I would be able to predict the behavior of the adult organism. That's 1664. And then Laplace repeated the same kind of message 
about the universe as a whole. If a highly intelligent being, of course, some people might think of that as God. I don't, I don't know what your theism is, so I don't want to worry about that. But if a highly intelligent being could see the equations of motion going forwards, they could also see them going backwards, and such a being would have a view, a totally clear view, of what has happened in the past and what would happen in the future. And so this leads us to the great quantum mechanician Schrödinger. And Schrödinger, in 1943, gave a famous set of lectures at the Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies, published as a book called What is Life? And he pointed out, first of all, that physics is the generation of order from disorder. And what he meant by that is this, that at the molecular level, like the gas molecules in this room, there would be stochasticity, the random motion that is produced by any molecules that have kinetic energy, in other words, not at a, an extremely low temperature. But of course, if the gas molecules are constrained, as the ones in this room are by the walls of the room, or in a balloon, for example, something very interesting happens. You then get the beautifully smooth, determinate laws of thermodynamics for pressure, volume, and temperature. So physics, he said, was order from disorder. But then, he said, but biology is different. It's order, at a high level, from order at the molecular level. Now, how could he think that? He thought that because he made a very important and in an absolutely correct prediction, which is that the genetic material, when it was found, it wasn't known in 1943 that it was DNA, but when it was found, it would be found to be what he called a non-periodic crystal. And if you think of a long polymer, in this case, of course, of the nucleic acids, as, as it were, a kind of crystal, then it's certainly non-periodic. That's how it contains information. And so... I think, you remember, the, the, these were the days at which X-ray crystallography was being used by people like Dorothy Hodgkin to work out the structure of vitamin B12 and many other people using X-ray crystallography, as indeed did Watson and Crick and Wilkins um, and Franklin later on to determine the structure of DNA, to determine the structure of molecules. So I think he thought that that means that the reading of the genetic material would be a completely determinate process. Now, there's no way in which that can be true either. Does biology generate order from order? Or, if you take the opposite view, which I do in both of my little books on this, Music of Life and the book that's just come out and available at the back there, there's the end of the advertisement. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, if you take the view I take, it's that biology also mostly, and most of the time, has to generate order, functionality, from disorder at the bottom level, because there's no way in which the molecules of a biological system can avoid the stochasticity that molecules generally show if they have kinetic energy, which means that, that, uh, that they are at a high enough uh, temperature. And we can prove that with physiological and biochemical experiments because stochasticity is a key feature of gene expression. So I'm going to come on now to harnessing stochasticity. Very interesting study done just a few years ago by Sui Huang and his colleagues um, in which they investigated the amount of gene expression of a particular protein, doesn't matter what the protein is, it's actually SCA1, but you can do this with almost any protein, and you look at how the gene expression levels vary in the different cells of the same population. So they're all derived from the same genome. It's a clonal population. And what you find is, as you can see at the top there, that there's great stochasticity. How great, in this case, it's 1,000 fold. The expression at the highest expression level is 1,000 times the expression at the low expression level in different cells. Moreover, we can prove that this is a 
cell or rather multi-cell level attractor because if you go on to do these interesting experiments in which you take populations for example that have a simple bell-shaped distribution curve and you clone from the high expression cells you will find that initially they indeed do um, express at the high level but within a week of the cells reproducing themselves and producing a larger and larger population you're back to the original population it's an attractor it's the property of the population as a whole the population as a whole I don't know why this particular population is producing this particular distribution, but it's though it's saying, and I'm anthropomorphizing here, I need this distribution. Why should they why should cells need that? Just incidentally, if you if you have a population that is bimodal and you clone from one of the um, peaks, again you get the same result. Initially, the cells follow the peak from which they were generated, but eventually you come back to the bimodal distribution. That also, therefore, is a population attractor. So, the question then arises, how can stochasticity be used by organisms functionally? And the answer is very simple. That provides a range of expression to enable response to stress. So, organisms with populations that are diverse, just through natural selection of those cells that are most appropriate for the challenge that they find, those will survive and reproduce. So you only need to add natural selection within the organism in this case to arrive at a clear way in which the range of expression can be used in turn to produce functionality. But then the question is how do cells feed information from the environment to control the genome. You see, if we represented a molecule as big as my hand, and you ask the question, where is the cell membrane in which that molecule sits, it would be somewhere up in Aberdeen or down in Bordeaux. Cells are that big, viewed from a molecule. So how on earth there's a signal right up at the cell surface, several on this scale, hundreds of miles away, get transmitted down to the genome to tell it what to do. And of course, people once thought that was impossible. That's why people like Richard Dawkins write, you know, sealed off from the outside world, as um, what you can say about the genome. Well, the answer is that physiologists and biochemists have beautifully worked this out. I'll take only one example. This happens to be an example from one of my former collaborators, Dick Chen, now working in New York University. And what they did was to show that the entry of calcium through some channels right at the surface membrane, so that's way up in Aberdeen, can then trigger a biochemical cascade which then produces a molecule that can be attached to one of the motors that goes down on the tubules to be transmitted right the way down to the nucleus and that can be that information can be specific so the answer is the microfilaments form the roadway the communication line and it's possible therefore for in this case the genome to know about micro events right up there in Aberdeen or way down in Bordeaux. So there's no, there are many other studies of this kind. I, I've, I just quoted one. So there's no problem any longer in understanding how cells can sense the environmental challenge, as they do, for example, with the immune system, and how that can be triggered to produce change in the genome and in gene expression and even to direct mutation. And that's the big thing that was forbidden by the modern synthesis, neo-Darwinist view of evolution. And we all know how that happens. <coughs> um, it happens in many cases by targeted hypermutation. I'm going to give one example from the immune system and then 
indicate with a few examples how it also occurs in whole organisms and how does it work. Well, immunologists have known this for very many years. If you take the, um, the sequence, either the genome sequence or the uh, protein sequence, um, for an immunoglobulin, there are two parts to it. One, V, is the variable part of the protein. The other part, which gives its immunoglobulin characteristic, enables it to function as an immunoglobulin, doesn't change. The mutation that is triggered by the signal, in this case by an antigen arriving, of course is restricted to the variable region. That's where the functionality comes in. It's stochastic, so far as we know, you know, as the wheel turns there, um, it's random, but what is not random is the targeting. It's only to that region uh, of the uh, genome. Now, one other thing to say, that change in frequencies looks like a simple curve here at the moment, but that change in frequency, of course, can be up to 100,000 times normal, even up to a million times normal. So it's a huge hypermutation. If that was happening in the genome as a whole, the organism wouldn't survive, and you and I would not survive because our immune systems would not be able to be sufficiently selective. If you want to follow up on that, um, I got that particular diagram from this beautiful review by Odegaard and Schatz. Uh, as they say, somatic hypermutation needs to be targeted specifically to immunoglobulin genes and moreover to only the variable part of the immunoglobulin genes. It's not targeted every way. You can begin to see, therefore, where my concept of there being a kind of one-eyed view of the situation, a directional view, is coming from. So, um, I see this as a bit like the old-fashioned fruit machine. This is a fruit machine opened up to reveal its cogs and wheels, and of course what you used to do was to put a coin or two in, spin the wheels, hoping to get three lemons or three pineapples or whatever it is, and of course if you got uh, two lemons, let's say, and you wanted a third, what you would do would be to hold the two lemons constant. You put more coins in to spin the third wheel until eventually you got a lemon. Well, of course, you might find that you spend more money doing that than what you get out. <laughs> Evolution is a bit different, though. It always wins. <laughs> well, not quite always. Of course, species die out and so on. So you, you take my remark there with a pinch of salt. Um, now we come to... Um, that's in, of course, evolution of cellular... Um, genomic information in response to stress in cells in a particular organism that is not necessarily transmitted down through future generations. Now I'm coming on to the last examples I'm going to give in the talk which is examples that organisms do rearrange genomes and we've known that, that they do so in response to stress we've known that for more than 70 years. The great American biologist Barbara McClintock showed that way back in the 1930s, working on corn, she was able to watch how parts of... Of course, she didn't know about DNA in those days, not that it was the genetic code, but she observed parts of the chromosome here moving to incorporate itself in a different chromosome in corn. In 1957, she was warned that the papers she was publishing on this were not to be believed, and it would be better if she no longer published on that. Thirty years later, at the age of 81, 1983, she received the Nobel Prize precisely for mobile genetic elements. If anybody ever tells you that the genome is actually isolated, as Richard Dawkins tells us, from the outside world, the answer is it was shown that it is not as long ago as 70 years ago, and it won a very important Nobel Prize uh, for medicine. Why did the Nobel Prize Committee end up giving her the prize? Because everybody else had found it too. And she wrote 
a very perceptive article in Science. This was her Nobel Prize lecture. She wrote, we will have a greater appreciation of it, that's the genome significance, as a highly sensitive organ of the cell. She got the idea right. Something, she didn't know what, was responding in those cells and enabling their chromosomes to rearrange in response to a challenge in the environment. If that sounds familiar, inheritance of acquired characteristics, you can see where I'm coming from. And we can prove that that must have happened in evolution. Because if you go to the paper published in Nature on the sequencing of the human genome, celebrated in 2001, with great fanfare on both the American side, I think those were the days of presidents like Bill Clinton, and over here it might have been Tony Blair, I, can't, I think it must have been. <coughs> you know, they both announced this great achievement, at last we're reading the Book of Life, the genome was sequenced. Well, deep in those papers you'll find a very interesting comparison. This is actually from chromatin protein sequences, and each of these little icons, if you like, is a particular protein domain and of course has a particular DNA sequencing coding for it. Each of those is functional. Now the interesting thing is you go from yeast to worm to fly and right the way up to the human you observe not just gradual accumulation of point mutations, whole domains have moved around <coughs> the genome. I'm going to highlight them now. They are ones that have been, as it were, brought in by accretion, by a response to the environment, a reorganization of the domains that make up this kind of protein. And here they all are, there are many of them. Now what's the significance of that? I like to think of it rather like giving two children Lego bricks. And to one child, you give the original Lego bricks, the little ones that had to be laboriously put together to build an arch or a column or whatever it might be as an architectural feature. And to the other child, you give preformed arches and you ask them to build a bridge. This is indeed, incidentally, is an image of a Lego bridge. You know, it is blindingly obvious that the child that's got the preformed bits will get their fastest, and that's exactly what evolution has done. That's why evolution does what Eldridge and Gould showed way back in about 1972 with their concept of punctuated equilibrium. Because you see, what the fossil record shows us is that over long periods, even hundreds of millions of years, species can stay pretty constant. That's the period of stasis. But there can be periods 10 million or so years in which there's rapid mutation. I think that evolution is playing just like the children with the Lego bricks and getting there much faster. So it's not, as the original neo-Darwinist synthesis said, always gradual accumulation of point mutations. Now, there are examples where that is true. Hemoglobins are a very good example where we can trace the accumulation uh, of point mutations. And the point is it's not always like that. Now one or two examples to finish with. <coughs> I'm going to take this mostly from uh, bacteria. This is a lovely example where the response to stress leads, uh, in this case uh, in response to chemotherapy drugs and antibiotics, to the rapid evolution of genome change in response to unfavorable environments. And we know as medical people that this is what's giving the world a health scare. The antibiotics are producing precisely this kind of response. And I'll show in a moment how rapid the change can be in response to a challenge from the environment at the level of bacteria. Um, this does it. This is a study that was published just a year or so ago it's actually at a, a team working in Reading. And what they did, 
They took bacteria that have got swimmer flagelli swimming around with their flagelli waving around to swim around. And they removed the DNA for one of the regulatory proteins in the network that switches the flagella production on. So you get bacteria with no flagelli, they can't swim around. You then allow them to breed. Within four days, the flagelli are back. Now remember, they didn't knock out the DNA for the flagelli themselves. I think if they'd done that, you could predict it might be a thousand years before they came back. Four days, how was that done? A totally different regulatory network, normally involved in nitrogen synthesis, sorry, nitrogen metabolism, um, was, as it were, recruited with indeed some mutations, but here's where the targeted hypermutation must be coming in because those mutations weren't everywhere in the genome, which enabled that regulatory mechanism, that regulatory network, to take over the function of triggering the production of flagelli. That's four days, and that gives us pause for thought, and that's why bacteria can manage to do things very quickly. One final example, um, this uh, is from another very recent paper. Quite a lot of this work is very recent. I'm referring, you see, in this talk to work that was shown way back 70 odd years ago, as with Barbara McClintock, but also showing how recent experimental work has fully confirmed many of the things that she and other biologists claimed was incompatible with the standard theory of evolution. And what Jack and uh, his colleagues conclude in this article in PNAS is that cells possess specific mechanisms to optimize their genome in response to the environment. So I'm going to conclude now and leave plenty of time for questions and comment and discussion. Was the watchmaker blind? Well, you know, watchmakers usually don't use both eyes. <laughs> they are usually squinting down a tiny, you know, playing around um, with the mechanism um, to see. And so I rather think that we can say that the watchmaker, well, he was one-eyed. He knew whereabouts in the genome he should work. And here's another one, again, using the one-eyed approach. I say one-eyed because, of course, this is not somebody um, saying, well, we need to evolve arms and legs in creatures that need arms and legs that used to have fins, and therefore we'll do it in the following way. It's not full vision in the sense that somebody can draw up the blueprint and give that to the evolutionary process. The reason I call it one-eyed is that organisms themselves did the seeing, but they didn't do so in a way that made it possible to see immediately what to do. They saw how to harness stochasticity with targeted mutation in order to produce the consequences which we see today, which is the evolutionary process that's produced us. So. Um, one final advertisement, which is to the book that's available at the back. It's only just been published a month or so ago, and you're welcome to um, purchase copies or just take notes down about it, um, if you wish, after the lecture and discussion. And that's the end of my talk. Um, I could say much more, and there's much more in the book, um, but I hope I've said enough to convince you that the world of physiology and medical research is back and seen to be highly relevant to the evolutionary process and therefore to the study of evolutionary biology. Thank you very much and I'm open to questions, criticisms, comments and so on. Thank you.